This is Sally welcoming you to the 2171st edition of the Enfield Talking newspaper. Dateline the 6th of December 2018. The readers this week are Sally, Geoffrey and Joan with Hass on the controls. The editor was Philip and the production and distribution team is Ali and Alan. Our title music is Country Rock Poker composed by Pat Prilly, Fernand Bouillon, Harry Brewer and performed by Jean-Jacques Perry and is used with his kind permission. The local news stories that we will be reading come from the Enfield Independent and the December edition of our Enfield Dispatch. The lead story this week is Lover Was Paid to Abuse Young Girl. Before the news, we have the sunrise and sunset times for the week beginning the 10th of December 2018. Sunrise at 07.55 and sunset at 15.52. Also, a request from the production team who are running low on memory sticks. Please have a hunt around at home and if you have any spares, then return them to us this week. Our final edition of the year will be recorded next week, Thursday the 13th of December, and we will be back on Thursday the 10th of January. Do get in touch with us to share your own news and special announcements. We love to hear from you. If you have any comments about the Enfield Talking newspaper, please phone Diane de Jersey on 020-8805-6578. She is your listener's representative and will be pleased to help you. Now Joan will read the first item of local news. A paedophile paid his lover to sexually abuse a young girl. Paula Dost Rice, 28, provided photos and footage of herself with a girl to her older lover, Andrew Barker, 53, in return for cash. The victim was aged between two and six when the abuse took place. In total, Dost Rice received £64,000. The pair pleaded guilty in a series of charges at Luton Crown Court. Dost Rice of Greencroft Gardens, Enfield, and Barker of Dog Kennel Lane, Chorley Wood, were both charged with eight counts of causing a child aged under 13 to engage in sexual activity between October 2014 and June 2017. Dos Rees was also charged with making and distributing indecent photographs of a child during the same time period and two counts of converting criminal property between February 2013 and May 2017. Barker was charged with making indecent images of children between January 2011 and June 2017. 1. Possession of extreme pornography between January 2011 and June 2017. 1. Possession of prohibited images of children between January 2011 and June 2017. Distribution of indecent images of children between October 2014 and June 2017. During sentencing, Judge Andrew Goimer described the pair's crimes as horrendous. Barker was sentenced to six years and nine months in prison while Dos Reese was jailed for six years. They have both been placed on the Sex Offenders Register for Life and have been made subject of a sexual harm prevention order for 12 years. Detective Sergeant Mike Birch from Hertfordshire Constabulary's Child Online Safeguarding Team said, Dos Rice met Barker through her work and they began a relationship in 2012. In 2014, the abuse began and continued for three years 
with Doss Rice receiving significant payments in return for her despicable crimes. Our main priority in this case was safeguarding the young victim who is now safe and is continuing to receive specialist support. An NSPCC spokesman said, This toxic relationship thrived off the sickening abuse of a very young child, with Dossery's brazenly profiting financially, and Barker finding the abuse for his own twisted pleasure. I have got an item called Bin Consultation. Enfield Council is seeking people's views on its plans to change bin collections. Seven different options for modifying the way household waste is collected have been drawn up by the council, including four which would see black wheelie bins picked up once a fortnight. Potential savings for taxpayers range from £97,000 to £2.8 million. The council is also keen to boost recycling rates, which currently in Enfield stand at 37%, which is below the 44% national average. A council spokesman said, the primary driver will be the amount of financial savings projected. All options will be considered before a decision is reached. The consultation ends on Sunday, the 6th of January, 2019. To take part, visit enfield.gov.uk forward slash waste. Changes to recycling and refuse service over Christmas and New Year. Your revised refuse and recycling collection dates are as follows. If your collection is normally on Tuesday the 25th of December 2018, your collection will be on Thursday the 27th of December 2018. If your collection is normally on Wednesday the 26th of December 2018, your collection will be on Friday the 28th of December 2018. If your collection is normally on Thursday the 27th of December 2018, then your collection will be on Saturday the 29th of December 2018. If your collection is normally on Friday the 28th of December 2018, then your collection will be on Sunday the 30th of December 2018. If your collection is normally on Tuesday the 1st of January 2019, then your collection will be on Wednesday the 2nd of January 2019. If your collection is normally on Wednesday the 2nd of January 2019, then your collection will be on Thursday the 3rd of January 2019. If your collection is normally on Thursday the 3rd of January 2019, then your collection will be on Friday the 4th of January 2019. And if your collection is normally on Friday the 4th of January 2019, then your collection will be on Saturday the 5th of January 2019. The Barrowell Green Recycling Centre will be closed on Monday the 24th of December 2018, Tuesday the 25th of December 2018, Wednesday the 26th of December 2018, Monday the 31st of December 2018, Tuesday the 1st of January 2019. The centre will be open as usual on other days. Christmas tree recycling. If you receive a garden recycling collection, please put your tree out for collection with your garden waste on your collection day. Please remove all decorations, pots and turf from your tree as these cannot be recycled. If your tree is taller than six feet, please take it to one of the parks listed below 
or cut into smaller pieces as it cannot be collected otherwise. Until the 13th of January 2019, trees can also be taken to Pims Park, Bush Hill Park, Berry Lodge Gardens, Town Park, Jubilee Park, Albany Park, Arnos Park, Durance Park, Broomfield Park, Tottenhall Sports Ground, Oakwood Park, Grovelands Park and Trent Park. Trees are to be left inside the park gate for collection by park staff. Trees can be taken to Barrowell Green Recycling Centre after this date. Council offices will be closed on Monday the 24th of December and reopen on the 27th of December. We will close again on the 1st of January. For libraries and registrars, visit www.enfield.gov.uk This is a notice about the activities and classes for the over 50s in Enfield held at the Ruth Winston House in Green Lanes. Exercise Pilates, Tai Chi, Keep Fit, Zumba, Chair Exercises, Strong Dance Latin American, line dancing, tea dance. Languages, Spanish, Italian, French conversation. Arts and crafts, dressmaking, art, mosaics, flower power. Computer courses, Windows, Word, Internet, smartphone, iPad. As well as bridge, whist, creative writing, drama, book club and many more. Other events which may interest you, drop-in, which includes bingo, scrabble, knitting group, tea and coffee and great company. Daily lunches and Thursday hot lunch club. We're always happy to enrol new enthusiastic volunteers for our vibrant centre. Contact us for information. And there's a phone number here. 020-8886-5346 I have an item called New Tube Trains. New trains will be introduced on the Piccadilly line between 2024 and 2026 and this has been announced by Transport for London. The fleet of 94 air-conditioned walk-through trains will improve accessibility and increase capacity on the line, and the Piccadilly line stops at four stations in Enfield Borough. Frequency will also be raised from 24 to 27 trains per hour. The P Piccadilly line's existing trains were built in 1970s and they're becoming increasingly unreliable. Nigel Holness, who is the managing director of London Underground, said the introduction of new trains on the Piccadilly line will significantly improve the journeys of millions of our customers, providing more frequent and more reliable trains for decades to come. Shopping mall site sold for £72 million. The sale of a large housing estate will not affect the rights of residents, according to one of its housing associations. Edmonton Green Shopping Centre was sold to a property investment firm last month for £72 million, with the site's three tower blocks also made part of the deal. More than 1,000 people live on the estate. Crosstree Real Estate Partners bought the town centre site from previous owners St Modwin, which had itself bought it from Enfield Council in the 1990s. Crosstree already owns retail property in Soho, Mayfair and at the O2 Arena in Greenwich, 
but now wants to exploit growth opportunities in outer London. A spokesperson for Housing Association Metropolitan Thames Valley said the private sale will not affect our legal rights as the leaseholder at three of the site's residential blocks or the rights of our residents who live in them. Edmonton Green Shopping Centre was built in the late 1960s and early 1970s and is regarded as an example of the period's brutalist architecture. In 1990, the leasehold for the site was sold by the council to St Modwin, while the homes in the tower blocks were transferred to a partnership between Metropolitan Housing Trust, now called Metropolitan Thames Valley, and London and Quadrant, L&Q. Matt Mason, director of Crosstree, said, We are excited to play our part in the improvement of this community-focused retail centre and to help create a thriving town centre and neighbourhood. We are committed to the long-term future of Edmonton Green and look forward to working with the council and local community to support the growth and prosperity of this strategically important site within Enfield. Edmonton NP Kate Ossimore said the sale has potential to be positive but also warned Understandably, shopkeepers and local residents have some trepidation about what the change of ownership will mean. Tenants are hoping to learn more soon about the new owners and their plans for the shopping centre. Of greatest anxiety, tenants are concerned about the content of future leases, what kind of relationship will be on offer from Crosstree and whether rents will rise. My hope is that tangible steps are taken to help businesses in the shopping centre flourish. In the late 2000s, St Modwin regenerated the site, building new blocks of flats and a large supermarket, while a new bus station was also built. The company now says it lacks strong structural growth characteristics. Crosstree has judged the potential of Edmonton Green differently. Speaking to the dispatch about the sale, a company spokesperson said, Crosstree believes there are growth opportunities in outer London. The Edmonton Green site covers 10 hectares and includes 754 homes, 123 shops, a daily market, a library, community centre and more than 1,000 car parking spaces. Enfield Council retains the freehold of the site and would make the decision about any redevelopment plan should it be proposed. Asked what changes Crosstree might make, the spokesperson added, we are looking to make improvements in the short term as well as identify medium-term opportunities to enhance customer experience. An L&Q spokesperson said, Our residents will not be affected by the sale of Edmonton Green Shopping Centre. The council declined to comment. Your all-inclusive Christmas. A theatre in Cockfosters is gearing up for its annual festive extravaganza. The festive period is a massively busy time at Chicken Shed. Our brand new musical version of A Christmas Carol will run for seven weeks with 59 performances and 800 people in the cast. As if that isn't enough, we also have a show for young audiences called Christmas Tales, which performs 19 shows in our theatre and 20 at Dugdale Centre in Enfield. All this means that more than 20,000 people will see a chicken shed show this Christmas. So why choose to watch a chicken shed show? For more than 40 years, we've been showcasing our vision of social inclusion, creating beautiful theatre by bringing together 
children and young people from all backgrounds and abilities. We believe that by including and welcoming everyone, truly amazing things can happen. It's been said that Chicken Shed offers a glimpse of a better world, and we know that many of our most loyal audience members say that is not really Christmas until they've seen our show. For 2018, we've chosen to create a brand new production based on the Charles Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol, one that perhaps invented the modern idea of Christmas, the famous story of the mean skin flint, flint Ebenezer Scrooge coming to understand its true meaning after visitations from four ghosts is of course well known. Scrooge is shown scenes from his own Christmases past, present and future, but also the experiences of the Cratchits and especially of Tiny Tim. It is in fact not his own miserable end foretold that changes him, rather it is being shown that Tiny Tim is no longer where he should be at the heart of the Cratchit family. This is what moves Scrooge. This man who previously said, every idiot that goes around with Merry Christmas on his lips should be buried with a stake of holly through his heart. A chicken shed, we believe in the value and importance of every individual. This is what ultimately transforms Scrooge, who gets to know and care about Tiny Tim, rather than some obscure notion of the poor or the sick and who then feels the tragedy of his loss so terribly. Chicken Shed works to give a voice to all young people, those who might be ignored, left behind or disregarded. And because we work to include everyone, when you see one of our shows, you'll see what society really looks like. We can guarantee a great show that will leave you feeling uplifted and inspired. A Christmas Carol is on that chicken shed from now until Saturday the 5th of January. Christmas Tales is on at Dugdale Centre from Wednesday the 5th of December until Sunday the 30th of December. For more information and to buy tickets, call 020-8292-9222 and vis visit chickenshed.org.uk I'm going to read an item which accompanies has come from Enfield Dispatch and it is headed up Help Save Our Theatre. The item has been written by Moran McWilliams from Amateur Drama Group St Monica's Players and it is all concerned with why the intimate theatre must be saved. And um, I have to say that this is very much the thought of my wife, Joan, who has acted frequently at the Intimate Theatre. So, should the Intimate Theatre be demolished? Enfield stands to lose part of its artistic heritage. The venue in Palmer's Green was built next to St Monica's Church Hall in 1931, but in 1935 it was handed over to, St. John Clement, to Sir John Clements as the home for his repertory theatre company. This set the intimate on its path to become part of not just local but national cultural history. As a theatre, it's welcomed many famous actors, but the intimate itself has also played an important role. It was the first theatre to reopen during the Second World War, and it hosted the first ever play to be screened live on television. The building also contains significant architectural features, including its sprung floor, counterweight balcony and plaster proscenium arch. 
in 1988, it was listed for dual use as a theatre and a church hall. Sadly, the church now views the theatre as a burden. They plan to, to demolish it to make way for a block of flats and a new parish centre. And to fund this, they will sell the current parish centre in Cannon Hill. Warren McWilliams writes, We fully support the good work of the parish, but feel that by developing the existing building, the needs of both parish and community could be met sooner at a reduced cost. We're under no illusions as to the current state of the venue through mismanagement and neglect. It has been allowed to deteriorate. But despite that, it still runs at a profit. We sent our proposals to the diocese, but they have been completely ignored. With small financial investment and volunteer help, the intimate would be an asset to the parish and to the community. Despite being users for decades, local groups such as ours were not consulted in the church's five-year building audit because we're not considered to be parish groups. Our knowledge of the venue would have been a valuable asset and we would have relished the opportunity to take part. He points out that there is already a large and a small hall on the site. The proposed replacement will house one large hall that could be divided into two small halls. Access to the current small hall does need to be improved, but this could be done without demolishing an entire building. Um, this proposed approach is akin to uh, buying a new television because the batteries in your remote have died. We devised alternative options and were told we would be granted a meeting with the committee, but it has never materialised. We sent our proposals to the diocese, but they have been ignored. Our plans, available on St Monica's players website retain all the church's assets and meet the needs of parish and community whilst offering the potential for greater financial return to sign the petition to save the intimate theatre visit u.38degrees.org.uk forward slash petitions forward slash Save the Intimate Theatre, Palmer's Green. And I do so much hope that you will decide to sign that petition. Warning as food bank use rises. The North Enfield Food Bank is preparing for Christmas, having helped nearly 7,000 people over the last year a 9.2% increase in demand. Set up in 2012 by national charity the Trussell Trust, North Enfield Food Bank in Lumina Way is giving out more food parcels than ever before, with 6,868 people receiving aid in the year up to October 2018. Speaking to the dispatch, Food Bank Manager Kerry Coe said, We provide emergency food supplies for those in crisis. Each person can get three days' food up to six times a year. They can be, fer be referred by 300 local partners, including schools, children's centres, housing associations, GPs and voluntary bodies. Nationwide, the Trussell Trust says use of its food banks is up 13% and attributes much of this to benefit changes. It claims food bank use rises faster in places where universal credit has been fully rolled out. 
But Kerry is cautious about the figures. She said, We don't know whether we are growing because more people need us or because more people have heard of us. It is probably both. North Enfield Food Bank actually offers a much wider range of services than it does food. Enfield Community Money Advice and Enfield Citizens Advice Bureau both hold regular sessions. There is a free language school and cooking lessons are provided. Kerry said, We offer baby food, baby milk, nappies, toiletries and sanitary protection. We can buy families school uniforms. We try to signpost people to other places they can get help. Christmas often leads to a surge in donations. Fresh fruit and vegetables are welcome, but the food bank cannot take more than it expects to distribute. About one-tenth of clients are referred to Enfield North Food Bank because of benefit delays. Nationally, the Trussell Trust agrees that food banks are not a permanent solution and has launched a three-year research programme. Emma Revy, the charity's chief executive, said, Food banks are providing absolutely vital support, but no charity can replace the dignity of having long-term financial security. We need to end poverty. We need to ensure that everyone has enough money coming in to cover the cost of the essentials. A Department for Work and Pensions spokesperson said, The reasons why people use food banks are complex. We continue to spend around £90 billion a year supporting people who need it, including those out of work or on a low income. This is a notice about a forthcoming pantomime, The Wizard of Oz. From Thursday the 6th until Saturday the 15th of December, the Intimate Theatre, Green Lanes, Palmer's Green, N13, 4DH. Help Dorothy get home in time for Christmas in this fun-filled original production brought to you by the award-winning London Pantomimers. Suitable for ages from 2 to 102. Free entry. Oh, tickets £10. Call 07932 607 901 or email boxoffice at londonpantomimers.org.uk. Enfield Choral Society's Christmas Concert. Saturday, the 15th of December, 7.30pm, St Stephen's Church, Bush Hill Park, 56 Village Road, Enfield, EN1, 2EU. We will be performing a selection of Christmas music, songs, carols and readings. Tickets £10. Children, students, £5. Call 07538. 538486 Email tickets at enfieldchoralsociety.org.uk I'm reading now an item from Enfield Independent and it's headed up School Opens New Outdoor Classroom A primary school has opened a new outdoor classroom <laughs> And this school is George Spicer Primary School, which was awarded £10,000 from the Aviva Community Fund, and they used this to build an outdoor classroom for pupils. The classroom was actually designed and built by local company GP Garden Services, and it was officially opened on Friday. The head teacher, Mrs Hilary Ballantyne said, This additional outdoor space for learning is fantastic. We must credit the hard work and commitment of our PTA, Friends of George Spicer, and the mass voting from so many parents 
and friends and family linked to the school, and that has enabled us to be the winners. Not only did we receive £10,000 from Aviva, but the PTA and Waitrose in Enfield donated the balance of the cost to help us have exactly what we need for our growing school. Members of GP Garden Services and Audrey Smith, the wife of long-standing school governor, who George Smith, who passed away earliest this year, aged 96, attended the classroom opening on Friday. George Smith was the school's ambassador governor and frequently visited the school to meet children, staff and parents. In order of his dedication to the school, the new part of the grounds has been named the George Smith Playground. Year five children sang songs and did some readings, giving thanks to the school PTA and, of course, to Audrey Smith. Vulnerable people at risk from benefit changes. People with a mental health diagnosis or learning disability are particularly likely to lose out on benefits they are entitled to, advocates for vulnerable people in Enfield have warned. Danny Newland, business manager at Enfield Carers Centre, said personal independence payment, PIP, awards were often incorrect with government figures showing 70% of appeals by claimants were successful. Asked by the dispatch how changes made to last year to PIP eligibility was impacting local people, Danny said that although the system was difficult for all claimants, those with mental health issues were most easily discouraged from appealing. I've seen a lot of questionable benefit decisions, he said. It's essential to understand the system when you frame your claim. Those with mental health or learning issues find it particularly difficult. He added that a difficulty was representation at appeal. I have sometimes managed cases to be done on the papers without the claimant present. We're just not funded to represent people at hearings, although we do what we can. A medical diagnosis or social work report doesn't explain how people's health conditions limit everyday life, which is what the system requires. Danny pointed out that correct PIP awards can be crucial because job seekers' allowance is very difficult for those with many mental health conditions. They can't always stick to an agreed weekly plan of activity. Jill Harrison of Enfield Citizens Advice Bureau agrees the PIP application process is lengthy and off-putting. She said people have to claim every year. They are refused, they have to appeal, they win on appeal and then it's time to apply again. Jill agrees with Danny that representation at appeal is a key weakness. Enfield CAB has two and a half benefit advisors. We help with initial claims and with appeals, even if we did not handle the original application. But to represent someone in person takes an advisor out of the office for half a day. We always try to get clients' representation often through the free representation unit. The government recently agreed to give additional PIP payments to up to 220,000 claimants with a mental health diagnosis. The government had argued that claimants who suffered psychological stress when travelling were not entitled to the mobility part of the PIP award but this decision was overturned in court. A spokesperson for the Department for Work and Pensions said, 
We are committed to ensuring that people with a mental health condition or disability get the support they're entitled to. A relatively small proportion of all decisions are overturned at appeal. In most successful appeals, decisions are overturned because people have submitted more oral or written evidence. This is a thank you notice. It says, thanks for donations. And it comes from a Mr. John Howes, who is a poppy organiser. The Eastern Enfield Royal British Legion collected £16,000 this year. Thanks go to the people of Eastern Enfield for their donations. Sainsbury's, Tesco, Morrison's, B&Q and Little provided safe locations for the collectors. The shield for the highest collector went to Pat Williams with £1,915. This shield has been presented every year since 1983. My thanks go to all who helped in the campaign, especially the collectors, Pat, Janet, Mary, Richard, Christine, Jeff, Rose, Joanna, Brian and Francis. The money will go to support the serving and ex-service community. This is another little notice about getting behind good causes. On Saturday, I attended the Salvation Army's tabletop sale at their church and community centre in Churchbury Lane. The warmest of welcomes I was given and I really had a great time. So thanks to all concerned and at this time of year we should all get behind our local good causes and give them all the support we can as they work so tirelessly and selflessly. Give what you can. That is from Dave Osborne, Carnarvon Avenue, Enfield. I have an item here which is headed up Police Appeal for Witnesses After Man Dies in Hit and Run. Police are appealing for witnesses after a suspected hit and run in which a man died. The incident happened in Chase Green Avenue, Enfield, near the junction of Bicolor Avenue, just after 5pm on November the 28th. A 52-year-old man was hit by a car that failed to stop at the scene. He was taken to North London Hospital and died from his injuries on Saturday. His next of kin, of course, have been informed. Detectives from the Met's Serious Collision Investigation Unit are appealing for witnesses, or indeed anyone, who may have a private home CCTV video or dash cam video. DC Darren Case said, The driver involved in this fatal collision fled the scene and left the victim seriously injured on the road. He tragically died from his injuries and we are investigating the circumstances. To help us with our inquiry, we would ask that anyone who may have any information about the collision, or indeed, of course, the driver, to contact us right away. The Serious Collision Investigation can be contacted on 0208 597 4874. Alternatively, call the police on 101 and quote CAD 5408 forward slash 28th November 18. Call for better hospital bus links rejected. Transport for London, TfL, has rejected calls to provide better access to Chase Farm Hospital. 
The newly expanded hospital in the Ridgeway is now expected to host 10,000 operations per year as the primary location for planned surgery across the Royal Free London NHS Foundation Trust. But there is currently no direct bus link between the hospital and its nearest tube station, Oakwood. Enfield Council leader Nessel Kaliskan wrote to to TFL in October to ask them to look at options to ensure patients and visitors travelling to the hospital can do so without any difficulty. But TFL argues that redirecting one of the local bus services to Chase Farm would increase journey times for passengers not visiting the hospital by half an hour. Jeff Hobbs, TFL's Director of Public Transport Service Planning, said, We have carried out a review of public transport to the hospital and believe it has the right service for the level of demand. A large number of high-frequency routes operate from Enfield Town Centre. Rerouting the 377, the 121 or the 307 would significantly increase journey times for all customers and would reduce the high-frequency links for residents into Enfield Town Centre. We are happy to work with the borough to ensure changing buses in the town centre is as easy as possible. Currently, three bus services stop at Chase Farm. The 313 between Chingford and Potter's Bar, the W8 to Lee Valley Leisure Complex and the W9 to Southgate. Natalie Forrest, Chase Farm's chief executive, wrote to to TFL with her concerns about poor bus links in July, while Enfield Over 50s Forum is now running a campaign to improve the hospital's access to public transport. Monty Meth, President of Enfield Over 50s Forum told the dispatch, The Royal Free has done a terrific job transforming the hospital, but now they are doing all the operations there and it is taking people forever to get to the hospital from train stations. This is a letter from an A. Rubin of London. It's about car parking charges. Please, can someone help before there is a mutiny? I went shopping with my husband to Edmonton and parked in the car park near Wilco and when finished went to pay the one pound. It wouldn't take our cards. We tried several times. People were getting annoyed and I can't blame them. My husband had to walk to the coach meter and it took him 20 minutes, and by the time he got back to our car, he was very stressed. He is 84, and not only that, it had gone up to £1.90. This item is accompanied by a picture of a lovely-looking old gentleman called Peter Goldstone. And it reads, A 98-year-old man, savagely beaten during a violent robbery in his own home, has died. Peter Goldstone of Bounds Green died in hospital in the early hours of Friday morning. He was taken to the hospital with a head injury and extensive bruising following an attack on his home in Evesham Road, Enfield, on November 6th. Police were called by the London Ambulance Service at around 10am the same day, whereupon, whereupon Mr Goldstone was discovered critically injured. He has been in hospital ever since. Met Police said there was clear evidence of a disturbance at the property and that a number of Mr Goldstone's possessions had been taken and they included a 26-year-old Panasonic television. 
Crime Stoppers previously announced a £10,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible. Of course, Mr Goldstone's family have been informed and a post-mortem examination will be held. Detective Inspector Paul Ridley from North Area CID said, We are all shocked and saddened by the news of Peter's death. It is the worst news ever for his family and for those who cared for, loved and knew him. I urge anyone who has information, no matter how small in detail, to search their contact conscience and contact police without delay. I particularly want to hear from anybody that may have been offered the Panasonic television. Its model is TXL26X10B and that of course is the television that was stolen or maybe people have seen vehicles Um, in the vicinity of Evesham Road and possibly those vehicles have appeared to be out of place. A Crime Stopper reward of 10,000 remains on on offer to anyone who can provide information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for this despicable offence. I do, however, also ask that Peter's family are left alone to grieve and come to terms with their loss at this very difficult time. Anyone who has information concerning this incident should contact Enfield CID by dialing 101 and quoting the reference 2140 forward slash 6th of November. Alternatively, to remain anonymous, call Crime Stoppers on 08000 555 111 or use their anonymous online form at http double dot forward slash forward slash www dot crimestoppersuk dot org Time to move forward. Enfield's council leader has said it is time to move forward after a motion of no confidence in her was not carried. The motion, which was tabled by members of Enfield Southgate Constituency Labour Party, the CLP, called on Council Leader Councillor Nessel Kaliskan to resign over her decision to suspend Cabinet Member for Public Health, Councillor Yasmin Brett. Councillor Brett faced disciplinary action after breaking ranks with her colleagues over a Cabinet report. But the no-confidence motion was not carried, while an amended motion calling for ongoing dialogue to resolve disagreements was approved at the CLP meeting on Thursday. (coughs) The council leader confirmed Councillor Brett had been reinstated as Cabinet Member for Public Health following the two-week suspension. Councillor Kaliskan said, I welcome the fact Enfield Southgate constituency Labour members did not carry the motion of no confidence. Now this is a time to move forward. This is the toughest of times for our communities because of Conservative government cuts. I will continue to be 100% focused as council leader, working with all councillors to address the real issues These include tackling poverty, the rising levels of violent crime, the lack of decent and affordable homes, chronic underfunding for our health services and budget cuts to our schools. These are issues that are having a real negative impact on the lives of Enfield residents. 
the amended motion that was carried by the CLP called for the clarification of the rules by which councillors can withdraw from cabinet discussions on the grounds of non-pecuniary interest. It also noted an investigation into the selection process for councillors that took place in May was taking place and called for internal disagreements to be resolved through ongoing dialogue rather than mutual public recrimination. This is a letter from Kay Brown from Old Park Road and it's headed Start Asking Questions. Perhaps it is surprising that a Cabinet member opposed the latest draft waste plan for North London, councillor suspended after breaking ranks, November the 28th. But equally surprising that others failed to do so. Here is a plan wishing to manage 140% of the amount of waste required by the Mayor as North London's share of the capital's total. To manage this, they postulate a need to secure nine hectares of new land and so, to be on the safe side, they wish to capture 93 hectares, more than ten times the amount, all of that being, correctly, industrial land. But even that is not enough, so in addition, the plan looks to capture a Grade 1 Site of Importance for Nature Conservation, ACAR Pink and Way, at close to six hectares on which to develop a waste site. That's 100 hectares when they need nine, indeed less than nine, as detailed within the plan itself reveals. Why? Why have the Waste Authority already spent approximately £40 million over recent years in buying Pinkham Way, about £12 million, plus linked fees to consultants, lawyers and such on top to get this far? Some may question why the committed purchase cost representing some 20% of the Waste Authority's balance sheet footing at the time, somehow never made it into that year's audited accounts. There are currently more questions than available answers. Cabinet members across the seven North London councils involved in the exercise could do worse than start to ask them. This item is accompanied by a somewhat gruesome picture of human bones which were discovered at Tottenham Park Cemetery earlier this year. And it reads, Enfield Council has welcomed the appointment of an inspector by the Ministry of Justice who will investigate concerns raised about the condition practices and management of the privately owned and operated Tottenham Park Cemetery. The cemetery recently went into administration and it had been previously the subject of a number of complaints from the Tottenham Park Charitable Trust and the community about the way it was being managed. Enfield Council leader, Councillor Nezel Kaliskan, met officials from the Ministry of Justice in September to discuss the case and urged the Ministry to intervene. The Ministry of Justice has confirmed the appointment of Peter Mitchell as an inspector with a remit to investigate concerns about the condition of the cemetery. The Enfield Council leader says a number of very serious concerns have been raised about the condition, practice and management of the cemetery and these have caused considerable distress and upset to families who have their loved ones 
buried at the cemetery. It is right and proper that the Ministry of Justice has appointed an inspector to check the cemetery so that those de these deeply upsetting concerns can be addressed, and I'm pleased that this has happened. He will be reporting back by December the 20th. This is something that I and Tottenham Charitable Trust have been calling for. This marks an important step in ensuring the voices of relatives of those buried in the cemetery are heard and we will fully support the investigation. Park City Investment sees 3,000 trees planted. More than 3,000 trees were planted at Montague Recreation Ground this weekend as part of plans to make London the world's first national park city. Joanne McCartney, London Assembly Member for Enfield and Haringey, took part in the mass tree planting session on Sunday to mark National Tree Week, in which 3,400 trees were planted. Ms McCartney said, Air pollution is one of the biggest challenges we face in London. By planting more trees, we can make a real difference in cleaning our dirty air and improving our well-being. It was wonderful to see so many residents volunteering their Sunday to help us plant these trees, which will benefit the whole community. This new woodland will be a great asset to residents and give us all a breath of fresh air. The event comes as part of the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan's, plans to make London the world's first national park city and saw 80,000 trees planted across the capital during the weekend. The trees planted came from Mr Khan's £1.5 million woodland fund. On Saturday this weekend, Mr Khan and Ahmadiyya Muslim Youth Association planted more than 15,000 trees at the Forest Gate Recreation Ground in Redbridge. Mr Khan said, My Greener City Fund is investing £12 million pounds in trees and green spaces to help London reach the goal of being confirmed as the world's first national park city next summer and expanding the capital's impressive urban forest of 8 million trees. This initiative is really capturing the imagination and it is fantastic to know that there will be so many Londoners out in force this week planting trees across the city. Money for kids. An extra £1 million will be spent on children's social care. Enfield Council has agreed. The money will be used to hire 18 new staff to help eased growing pressure on the service. Speaking at a meeting last month, the Cabinet Member for Children's Services, Achilles Giorgio, said the workload of caseworkers was significantly higher compared to other boroughs. We need to make sure if there is a vulnerable child that we act, Councillor Giorgio told the meeting. We can't allow our caseworkers to be overburdened. The priority of this local authority is funding in children's services and we have moved swiftly to take action. An Ofsted inspection of the Council's children's social care service is expected within six months. This item is headed up set in stone and it's accompanied by a lovely picture obviously taken in Enfield many, many years ago. The item is written by local historian Gary Boudia and it describes how a Victorian landmark in Enfield has endured. It reads, 
Made from Aberdeen granite, the fountain in Enfield Town has been a permanent feature since 1885 and it stands where a great elm tree dominated the area for years before it was blown down during a gale in 1836. A public fund for the fountain started in the summer of 1884, but because of a shortage of money, it was delayed until March 1885, and then it was finally opened without any appreciable ceremony. During 1884, the work to build the fountain was placed in the hands of the Metropolitan Drinking Fountain and Cattle Trough, Asso- Cattle Trough Association, which made its own contribution. When it finally opened in 1885, the fund was still £20 in arrears, and it's not really clear where the final money came from, but it is known that the local Baptist Tabernacle Church was selling photographs of the fountain for sixpence and ninepence each, possibly helping to raise money, the missing money. In 1895, the Enfield Gas Company installed four gas lamps for the fountain, which was hailed a great improvement and featured in many photographs of the time. However, sometime over the ensuing years, the gas lamps were removed and a trio of electric lamps protruding from above the cherubs were installed instead. It was reported in 1960 by the Enfield Gazette that the local council wanted to pull down the fountain, but this appears to have stirred up many feelings against the idea. Most residents viewed it as our own version of the fountain in Piccadilly Circus. However, again in 1969, the idea of removing the fountain arose, with many residents venting their displeasure at the council. People were especially angry with Councillor Graham Eustance, who would later lead the council, after he wrote that the public would be channelled across the intended roadway through guardrails. And this immediately caused a flood of letters to the Gazette, saying they would be herded like cattle across the road. Enfield Council wanted a one-way system introduced in the town and they deemed the fountain to be an outdated piece of Victoriana. The matter was put to the Enfield Preservation Society, asking them to suggest an alternative site. Thankfully, the situation was resolved and the two cherubs still atop the fountain and they are clinging to each other while all around them carry on with their daily deeds. We have reached the end of our programme for this week. Thank you for listening. So from the team of Sally, Jeffrey, Joan and Hass on the controls, it's goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Please remember to turn over the address label in your postal packet. Put the memory stick in the packet in a closed position and return it to us as soon as possible in readiness for the next edition. Don't forget you can call Diane de Jersey regarding any help you may require in connection with the Enfield Talking newspaper on 020-8805-6578. Coming up next, the latest news and information for the Greater London area from InfoSound. The Enfield Talking newspaper will be with you again in one week's time. <laughs>